What are five things about getting a dementia diagnosis that you need to know? If you haven't watched before, my name is Dr. Nicole Didick. I'm an internist and geriatrician, so I'm a medical doctor with additional certification in looking after older adults. Here on The Wrinkle, I like to share information that you can use to age well or to help someone age well. Uh, as a geriatrician, a big part of my practice is dementia. And Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia, but there are other types. And in this video, I'm going to cover five things that I think are common myths or misconceptions about what getting a diagnosis of dementia is all about. If you have someone who's living with dementia in your life, or maybe you're living with dementia yourself, I think you're going to want to hear this. If you like these videos, you can follow my YouTube channel or visit my website, thewrinkle.ca. All my information is there and there's lots more videos and blogs about dementia and other common aging issues. We talk about everything from sex to financial abuse. So I hope you'll join me over there. But let's talk about dementia and the five things I want you to know. Number one, a dementia diagnosis does not mean the end of independence. For example, someone who has a diagnosis of dementia does not necessarily have to move out of their house. They don't necessarily need to stop driving. And that may surprise you to hear that. But there are lots of people who have a diagnosis of dementia who are still driving. Now, some types of dementia, like frontotemporal dementia, for example, is pretty incompatible with driving because it affects things like judgment and insight, which need to be intact behind the wheel. But some people with early stages of other kinds of dementia are still able to drive. Driving is a skill that people have practiced often for decades, so they have a lot of that long-term memory there. And some people's dementia is mild enough that they have um, cognitive skills that can still allow them to navigate a vehicle safely. But someone who's living with dementia and also driving probably should be monitored closely. If I have a patient who's living with dementia who's driving, I ask family members to drive with them on a regular basis and then report to a medical professional if they see changes that are concerning. This means that the family member is in a bit of an awkward place. Um, it means that they are in a position of monitoring their family member, which can be tricky. So if somebody doesn't feel that they can do that, then sometimes we need to have a different conversation. There are also uh, programs for driver assessment for a medical driving test. So um, in Canada or in Ontario where I live, the Ministry of Transportation does not always do road tests automatically unless somebody's license is coming up for renewal, uh, which it does every two years uh, after the age of 80. A person has to go in and do a little uh, clock drawing test. And um, if they've had a moving violation, then they get a road test. But otherwise the ministry doesn't do that. But there are medical driving centers. And I have sent patients to those medical driving centers and sometimes they will get a pass. But the driving center indicates that because dementia can change with time, the person will probably need to be tested again within about a year to year and a half. But just because someone has a diagnosis of dementia does not necessarily mean that they need to stop driving. Nor does it mean that they need to move out of their house into a different kind of place like a retirement home or a long-term care home or even to move in with family. Now, most people who are living with dementia are living in the community in just a regular house rather than a, what we would call, I guess, a congregate setting or group setting. Again, it's the kind of thing that needs to be reevaluated over time. We need to look at what are the risks of the person um, living in the community versus what would be the benefits of them staying in the community. And there can be a lot of benefits. And those perceptions of risk and benefit are individualized. Some of us would choose to live with pretty significant risk because we value our independence more. Um, that's why it's good to kind of have those conversations before there's an illness like dementia. So talking to the people close to you about what your wishes and preferences are can help to give them guidance if you get a diagnosis like dementia or something else where that family member might have to speak for you. The second thing, and this comes up a lot, 
is that just because a person gets a diagnosis of dementia does not mean that they will absorb that diagnosis or believe it or remember it. A lot of times this happens. So I will do my 90 minute or more assessment, make a diagnosis of dementia. And then I'll get a call a couple weeks later saying, you know, why doesn't my mom get it? I need you to explain to her again that she has dementia. She just doesn't seem to get that. We keep telling her and it just causes conflict. This is pretty typical. And remember that, especially with Alzheimer's disease, um, the most common type of dementia, uh, insight can be affected as well as short-term memory. So somebody might not remember a diagnosis or they just might not believe it. They might not be aware of how their memory is letting them down as much as their family members are. And it's not because the person is in denial or they're conceited or they're trying to fib. Um, most of the time it's sincerely because there are changes in insight because of the brain changes and the person um, just doesn't see it that way. So it'd be sort of like if you knew that your shirt was blue, but someone was telling you that it was purple and why can't you just sort of accept that it's purple? Everyone else thinks it's purple. You have a purple shirt on today. You'd be pretty upset if someone kept insisting on that. And that's the way it can be if someone has changes in their insight. So what should you do with that? Well, definitely don't keep trying to convince someone that they're living with dementia. That would understandably be upsetting for them and not productive. So maybe coming up with other excuses as to why the person might need help in some areas um, or using therapeutic lies or fiblets, which we've talked about before. Um, those are often a better approach, but trying to find a strategy or a certain set of words or a certain person to tell someone they have dementia, that usually does not work. The third thing is that after a diagnosis of dementia, the journey will not necessarily be predictable. Oftentimes I find that people have a lot of questions about what stage their family member is in and how long they're going to stay in that stage and what's coming up next. And that's hard to predict. A lot of it has to do with the person themselves and their other health issues. So specifically uh, a common thing is if someone has a stroke or some other major medical event, um, then they might progress more quickly than if they didn't have one of those things happen. But in general, everybody's journey is different. That's a bit of a cliche, but it's true. I find uh, talking to other people who've got family members with dementia might be helpful, but their experience will probably be different from yours. So planning ahead is good, but wanting to get that um, clear path about what's going to happen next and when is almost impossible. And having that expectation can just lead to a lot of frustration. Another thing that people often think is that because there's a diagnosis of dementia, they can take over as the person's attorney. So if they have power of attorney for health or property, um, they feel that once there's that diagnosis, they can automatically take over. And that's not necessarily true. Now, some of it depends on how the person um, worded their own um, powers of attorney. Uh, papers, and I'm not a lawyer, but you know, those papers that you sign when you do give power of attorney, in my experience, a lot of them have different conditions, but usually just having a specific diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean that somebody needs to take over in decision making. Here in Ontario, and my practice is that a person's capacity to make a specific decision has to be considered on a case by case basis unless they have a very global impairment where it's obvious that they would have difficulty navigating. Um, most of the time people can be continue to make decisions for themselves and be their own attorneys in a lot of cases. So an example might be if a person has to go for an operation. Well, first we should talk to the person about why they need the operation and see if they're capable of making that decision before we automatically defer to someone else in the family. This happens a lot in subtle ways. So even in a lot of office visits, 
If someone has a diagnosis of dementia, sometimes the provider will automatically talk to a family member first. And that can make the person who's living with dementia feel a lot less capable, even when they still are. So it's good to think about that and that just because someone has a specific diagnosis doesn't necessarily mean that it's time for others to take over. And in my experience, it's actually people who are living with dementia seem to do well being able to be as independent with as much as possible for as long as possible. Again, it's navigating the benefit versus the risk in those situations. The other thing that I think people um, have a bit of a misconception about when it comes to dementia diagnosis is how we make the diagnosis. It's a little bit tricky and that's why it takes a geriatrician sometimes or a neurologist or psychiatrist uh, to really nail down the diagnosis. Most of the time, scans don't show typical changes in Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia. We usually use scans to rule out other things that could mimic dementia. So if you're waiting for a scan to come back to see if there's dementia or not, chances are that it won't really be that pivotal in the diagnostic process. Now, there are exceptions, of course, and there are different types of scans that can give us more information about specific types of dementia. Again, frontotemporal dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies um, do have some scans that we can do that are somewhat helpful in making that diagnosis. But most of the time, the diagnosis is made on the basis of the person's story. And not just the person, but also the people around the person. When I mention changes in insight, uh, that's something that it's, it's a lot of people seem to um, be surprised about when they learn that that's a big part of dementia. And, uh, but it's really important to understand that because someone who's living with Alzheimer's is not very likely to come and see me and say, you know, these are all the areas that I'm having trouble with. Um, so what's going on? Usually it's the people around them that will bring that to the physician's attention. And so those people need to bring it to the physician's attention. Um, that can feel a lot like you're tattletaling um, and it can be uncomfortable to bring up in front of the person who's living with dementia. But it's vital because if a physician, uh, because in someone's office, if they tell me that they're capable of putting their meals together, um, then I, I have no way of really verifying that unless somebody else tells me something different. I'm good, but I'm not that good. So I can't tell, I don't have ESP, and I can't tell by looking at somebody that they're failing in um, other areas. Sometimes I can. Um, so for example, if someone tells me that they're, you know, coloring their hair regularly and they've got four inches of roots, um, then, you know, I might say, okay, well, your hair, hair dye skills are, you know, you're overestimating them there. But most of the time, I don't know unless the person tells me. And everybody's different, so I can't tell. You know, I might, if somebody is wearing dirty clothing, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that, they, um, that they've been uh, having more trouble knowing when it's time to change their clothes. Maybe it was never important to them to have clean clothes. So that's why I need family members or other people to say, no, this is a big change. These are the changes that we're seeing. That's one of the key parts of making a diagnosis of dementia is the fact that there is um, a change in how the person's managing their day-to-day -day life. And usually that has to come from some kind of an informant. If you have information to share like that and you're not comfortable doing it in front of your family member, then probably bringing a letter with you or somehow getting a written letter uh, to the doctor beforehand or, or even after at some stage is another good way to do that. And that often spares you from um, sharing that information in front of your family member, which as I said, is understandably uncomfortable at times. So those are the misconceptions around getting a diagnosis of dementia that I think it's important to know. Knowing this would save you some time. So it might be helpful to understand what to expect about how a diagnosis is going to be made and when that diagnosis is received, what it means. Getting a diagnosis is definitely crossing a threshold but it's kind of a continuum, right? There's a spectrum of changes with the brain as people age and of functional changes too. 
going over that threshold from not getting a diagnosis to getting a diagnosis uh, may not be as big of a step as, as you might think. I think knowing what to expect when someone gets a diagnosis, um, again, it's, it's helpful, it might save you some time, and it might just help to understand what's going on and the best way to use your time going forward, rather than trying to argue with your family member that they have a dementia and that's why they have to make this change or accept this or this. Um, if you sort of put the diagnosis into the context of, um, you know, it's, it's one condition that's very important, it's probably gonna cause some changes going forward, but it doesn't mean an immediate switch is thrown that, um, that means that the person is suddenly powerless and um, needs to uh, make huge changes. Usually that doesn't happen, sometimes it does, but usually it's a matter of just um, monitoring and making accommodations as they need to happen. If you wanna learn more about dementia and the aging brain or caring for an older family member, or if you're just trying to age successfully yourself, I think you'll find a lot of useful information on my website, thewrinkle.ca, or here on YouTube, where I'd really love it if you would stay and watch another video, maybe the one that YouTube is suggesting right now. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, and you can follow me there. And on all of those platforms, you can leave a comment, ask a question, and tell me what you'd like to see on The Wrinkle. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, right here.